little better in Paduma. And now I know Mike, you have a great team there. So. Oh, they're absolutely fantastic. All, all of them, all of them. Oh, thank you, Cassandra. Oh yeah, you yeah know, I'm blushing. We go way back. <laughs> you made my day today, send me that picture. <laughs> yeah, she's getting cute. I mean, she's always cute, but she just gets cuter. <laughs> Uh, these meetings are bumping up against each other, which is why I apologize. I'm a little bit late. I just had to cut out of a meeting. <laughs> no worries. And welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll, we're just usually people are a little bit late, so we'll just start in, uh, in a minute here. So we had 70 registered. Uh, we don't anticipate that many actually being here, um, but we do want to give people a chance to file in before we get rolling. Right, now get us started here now. So yeah, welcome. Oh, uh, let me bring us back here. Welcome to uh, today's uh, book club on how to be an anti-racist uh, by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to mention that this is Zoom webinar. Uh, so you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself, uh, you know, have yourself be seen by video or not. Uh, it's up to you whether you want to uh, actually be seen, but uh, until we get to the actual discussion portions, we do ask that you keep yourself muted. Uh, you can feel free to use chat at any point though. And if you'd rather interact via chat, you can always do so, but it really helps discussion if you actually speak. Uh, towards the end of this session, we'll do a breakout room. Uh, so you can do smaller group discussions. If you have any trouble at that point, I'm happy to help. Uh, and you can feel free to ping me at any time before then if you have any technical issue. So uh, before we get started, I wanted to hand it off to our friends at the National Student Clearinghouse. Pepe had uh, some words to speak. So Pepe, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pepe Carreras, uh, Vice President of the Education Solutions Group at the National Student Clearinghouse. And it's an honor, no doubt, for the Clearinghouse at, uh, to sponsor this event, as well as for me to offer some brief remarks about such an important and current topic. I'd like to start with a confession, if I may, you know, when I was asked internally to introduce this topic, I felt my, my initial reaction was a, a feeling of discomfort, uh, unequipped almost to speak about how to be an anti-racist. Aside from my own personal experiences growing up in the island of Puerto Rico, where I was surrounded not just by palm trees and beautiful beaches, but also by people of every possible race on earth, I never really thought of myself as a, as a racist. In fact, my initial reaction was, you know, what could I possibly say about this topic that can make a difference? Perhaps I shouldn't say anything at all. I'm also not sure why this was an unsatisfactory response. And like most scholars, I do what I, I think I do best. When I don't know about a particular topic, I, I seek information, I try to learn, I try to share, and most of all, I try to act. It didn't take long for me to arrive at the most obvious of conclusions, and that was that, because it was staring me right in the face, there's a big difference between not being a racist and becoming an anti-racist. In other words, I too could become part of the solution instead of contributing to it by my inactions. Look, the point is not only am I still not an expert in the topic and worse, now I know how very little I do know about this particular topic, I find myself with uh, the possibility of not offering any excuses. I'm a product of my environment and how lucky was I to grow up somewhere where color and race were simply not a thing. However, fast forward today as a father, a leader, a member of this community, I can and I need to do more. There's no question that this process is not a sprint, but instead it's a journey. We need to fact find, seek multiple points of views, ask questions, and more importantly, we need to listen perhaps twice as much as we talk. There's no, no question why uh, you know, we have two ears and one mouth. We're supposed to do twice the listening versus the talking. The more questions we ask, the more we will learn. Many organizations I have worked with and for and including the Clearinghouse are focused on inclusion, diversity and access. But for it to be meaningful, it just, it's just as important to look inwardly as it is to look outwardly listening to staff, listening to schools, listening to learners. Definitions matter. 
dig deep because incisive definitions like Kendi's forces the reader to hold themselves accountable for their ideas and actions. So being an anti-racist, in my opinion, means moving beyond the not racist defense and instead embracing and articulating decidedly anti-racist views and beliefs. Confront your own ideas and beliefs. Once you start identifying racial disparities, examine where your own views are and or beliefs and to see if they're justified, um, if they offer justification for racial inequality. Most importantly, believe you can do more. You can be part of the solution, champion ideas and take action. I hope that is nothing else that the discussion today makes us inquisitive about the topic, shows this conversation in a new context, forces meaningful dialogue, and just as I stated before, incite action. I still have faith in the human race. I'm rooting for all of us. And I thank you for being here and I look forward to your individual and collective contributions. We can most certainly make a difference. Thank you so much there, Pepe. And uh, now I wanna introduce our uh, facilitators for the discussion today. I'm Joyce Raymond Phil, and I am the president and owner of Dynamic Dimensions Unlimited, a coaching and consulting firm. Uh, Cassandra Moore, APRO's president of access and, and equity, invited me to co-facilitate today, and I'm most eager to do so. You notice that it says Joyce R. Phillips. The R stands for Raymond. That is the name of my grandfather, who was a slave, a runaway slave, and served in the Civil War. So I just wanted you to know that. I always bring his name up to honor him. Thank you, Joyce. Um, hello, everyone. I am Dr. Soraya Urquiza. I am the registrar for the American Film Institute Conservatory here in Los Angeles, California. Uh, sorry, East Coast folks, it is Sunday and 75 here. I just had to, you know, give you a little something to, to think about. I <laughs> am um, very thankful for ACRA for uh, letting me uh, co-facilitate this discussion. Um, and I think we're, I think we can ready to move on. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I'm also the ACRA Latinx caucus uh, chair. <laughs> Cassandra's looking at me like, hello, remember? <laughs> um, so thank you so much for uh, registering and attending this book club discussion. Um, I won't read the brief overview because you've all, I, I'm assuming you've all read this book, which is why you're here. I did want to mention um, how, um, I, I did want to give a little shout out to Acro for being so proactive when it comes to these, this anti-racist work by Dr. Abram X. Kendi. Um, back in 2019, um, I, I read this book, or rather I listened to this book because uh, I did the audio version. And I was sitting around at, at PACRO, which is the Pacific Regional version of ACRO. Um, and Rhonda Kitch was our ACRO rep for that specific conference. And we were all having lunch and we were just mentioning, oh, what, you know, what books are you reading? And I mentioned that I was uh, reading uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, Fast forward to the end of the conference and Rhonda's uh, actually on her way out and she taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, before I go, I want to let you know to just keep an eye out on your email for the, to when ACRO announces their speakers for the 2020 conference. And I thought, oh, okay. And a few weeks later, the email comes out and the speaker for the 2020 conference was Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, um, which I was ecstatic about because this is before the pandemic. This is before the murder of George Floyd. This is before everything, you know, our whole world was turned upside down. Um, so I really want to thank and commend ACRO for being proactive as opposed to reactive when it comes to this. Let me go to the next slide. So we're going to discuss um, several points. We're going to start off with institutional change. Um, at our, yeah, I'm sure, um, like most places, we're having diversity and equity initiatives that are now, you know, leading the way as far as having trainings um, on various issues. And our institution is no different. And we had um, a diversity uh, person come in and lead a training, uh, Dr. Suman Pendekor. And she said something that really resonated with me in regards to thinking of anti-racist work within our institutions. 
And she stated that speed is the friend of bias. Um, and when I reflected on that, I started thinking that is, that's so true because how many times have we hired somebody or because we just need somebody right now? It's always, you know, somebody leaves and then we need to hire someone within, you know, that month because the work will go undone. And, you know, we start that panic. Um, so Joyce, I wanted to touch base with you as an HR professional. So how can we be more effective in our faculty and staff hirings and not let speed be our friend of, you know, since speed is a friend of bias, how do we combat that? Well, one of the things I'd like to say and start with first is that, remember all of us are comfortable with those people that look like us or who are like us. And when you, you start to hire someone, what is your criteria? And you need to also look at what is going on in your department or in that particular unit where you're hiring someone. What's the rest of the team look like? Do they represent your students? Are they diverse? And one of the things that you need to do when you do that is look around the table at the interview group. Does that inter group, uh, interview group, are they the same people that are always interviewing? the same people. And so you get the same. You need to challenge. We as individuals need to be able to say, you know, I'm looking around this table and it doesn't look like we have really a strong representation of all types of people. That would be number one. The other piece is it's okay when you're starting to hire someone to say, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board because I'm not sure we have what we need. And that's one of the ways that you can take a look at that. When any of us walk out of our homes and we carry with us our, our history, our perceptions, our culture, all of those things, and we walk out the door and we enter the other door of our workplace, we haven't changed. We don't instantly have what we need in terms of looking and making sure that we're bringing in the right people and the people who, and, and creating this diverse, wonderful at, at, atmosphere. So that's one of the things I would say, look at yourself and ask yourself, when am I contributing? And am I willing to speak up when it's not just right? Right, thank you so much. And I think we also just need to remind ourselves the, of the definition of being anti-racist, right? And that's a person willing to admit and recognize when we have been racist and willing to challenge racist policies. Um, all of us here are involved in institutional policy to some extent. So that's something really important to keep in mind, especially when we're discussing, you know, being intentional about our student enrollment and managing inclusivity um, within our institutions. Um, our student enrollment population is rapidly diversifying. Um, unfortunately, our offices are not. So our students of color are more likely to see themselves uh, reflected, um, or I'm sorry, are not Nothing. seeing themselves reflected in the administration, um, which is just as important as seeing yourself reflected within the classroom. So how do we go about being intentional with our student enrollment? And how do we go about um, making sure that those students are reflected and are being serviced um, appropriately? Because it's one thing to get everybody in the door. It's another thing to actually um, support them once they are there. I think, you know, one of the things you talked about and, and, and Kendi talks about a lot is policies. When's the last time you looked at your hiring policy? What do your ads look like? Where are you looking for people? So many times, again, we go to the same places. We don't have the ads in the right place. We've got an ad that has that good housekeeping sign, E-O-E, E-O-C. We've got that. But what does it really mean? So we have to get somewhat granular so we start to understand what we are doing because we feel, oh, we've got this, but you have to start tearing apart 
I'm peeling the onion and taking a look at it and being able to speak to it. Because if you heard Pepe when he started, that we're all on this journey. And if you didn't speak up before and you didn't think about it, what are you willing to do now so that you can make sure that the students that are coming into your college have people that they can look up to mm -hmm. and identify with? Right. And, and I think in regards to staff culture uh, and within our administrative units, um, not just saying that this is that you are anti racist and saying that uh, you're dedicating yourself to challenge racist policies, but actually following through with that. So, you know, I keep, I'm going to keep coming back to this action speak louder than words moment. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, I'm, I'm an anti racist. I, I'm, I'm, I read the book, I'm at this book club, I, I'm, I'm trying to do the work. But then your personal Twitter uh, account reflects very different views. So, you know, you're, you're, you're posting very racist, you're, you're supporting very racist rhetoric, you're support, you know, supporting racist individuals. Um, and that really, you know, at, for your staff, if they see that, and they see that you're behaving differently, in one aspect, than what you're saying, then that's going to have an impact on the staff culture which is, you know, it's a trickle down effect. Um, our students that see that and that you're representing that institution, they're gonna wonder to themselves, oh, wait, but my I, I'm undocumented. And this person just posted or, you know, just liked a tweet that, of somebody stating that undocumented people are A, B, and C, mm -hmm. right? So that's something that if we're really committed to this work, then, we need to be cognizant on all levels. We can't compartmentalize this work. This work is institutional. This work is, is within our communities. This work is within ourselves. Um, and that's something that we need to constantly work at and be um, aware of. So Raya, I think you've made a very strong point because the second part of this under the first question is, who are you? Mm -hmm. And this book challenges us to take a look at ourselves. If you just read the book, put it aside, what a good book, then you're not doing what we need to do. I was challenged by this book. I was upset at first because I felt that Kindy had given to the folks who are in power a get out of jail card. I had to examine this by only examining myself. And where was I? Where was I? I'm black. I'm the child, a grandchild of a slave. There's no way I can be racist. But once I started to examine it and look at racism, not as people, but as policies that have created systems that are impactful and realize that my journey is only beginning, then I was able to start to say, okay, I need to be intentional about the things that I do. I need to be intentional when it's important for, and, and be aware when it's important for me to speak up at meetings or at, in my community so that I can make a difference. And that is one of the things that this book does do for us. Um, I thought I had no power. I do have power. And he explained that too very well. I never thought of racism in terms of policies, but before, like most people, I thought of it in terms of people and the attitudes that we hold. Yeah, I think he's very intentional about mentioning how we as people of color have the power to resist. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's such a powerful statement, um, but it takes a lot of work to do this. And it takes a lot of work because largely because you have to admit that you were wrong at some point, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's what you just touched on, Joyce, where it, it upset you at first. Um, and, and same for me, it was like, oh, right. That is a racist, you know, I have internalized that racism. You know, within the Latinx community, there is a lot of internalized racism. Um, there's a lot of anti-Blackness within our community. That's, you know, it's, it's systemic. 
it's since you're born essentially that you're exposed to these anti-black or you know these racist ideas and at the end of the day it's just internalized whiteness you know we're systematically taught white supremacy um and it takes a lot of work to undo that so and it takes it takes heart and a belief that we can make a better world to even start to confront it. You know, we talk about diversity, but diversity is useless without inclusion. Oof. Definitely. And when we've checked all the diversity boxes, but does everyone feel valued and respected and have access to the same opportunities as everyone else? So when you start to think about managing inclusivity, you've got to ask those questions as well. And you have to make sure that everyone is able to share information that they can share it about their culture, they bring to the table the knowledge, no matter in your gender, the whole nine yards, what are you able to do so that it's just not, oh, everybody, I've got so many brown people, so many yellow people, and hey, this is working. But then they never get to speak. You never take their ideas. You don't understand what it's like to not be, be able to hear well. So you've done nothing about it. So we've got to start to be inclusive along with that and bring that to the managerial level. And you can do that easily, especially mm -hmm. when you're sitting at a table and you notice that no, the people that are on the other side never get to speak or no one listens well when, when they do speak. So inclusivity is, is, is vital and it's, it's useless. It's not useless. Diversity is useless without that in, in inclusiveness. Um, and I, I would also further that within our institutions, if all of the directors are people are you know are diverse but the executive level is not then that's something to reflect on you know if if there's only one person of color in the e-suite you know at, at the provost level at those executive level positions that's something to reflect on and i tell you not only do you reflect on it but i come from a generation where most of the time I was the only person at the table. And I will share with you that I had to keep my hand on my hip because when someone would say something that was really disturbing, that did not reflect my beliefs, I had to squeeze myself, write down a few words so that when I gave the answer to that or challenged that, I was not turning off the world because the challenge needed to be made. So mm. I might have been at the table, but there were times when I was not included and I had to, you know, hey, hey, I'm here, please listen. I don't know how much that work that is present now. You have to be aware of that. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, I, I did my dissertation on uh, Latinas in Higher Education Administration um, and I will say from the research that I've conducted, unfortunately, that's still the case mm -hmm. in a lot of, a lot of times, unfortunately. Um, but I mean, this, this is within, so as we mentioned that this takes work, right? Um, and this is within our institution, but we also need to think of it on a community level. Um, so I think we can actually probably go to the next slide. So how, how can, how are we going to, do this on a broader spoke, uh, spectrum. So within our community, and so the questions that we're asking you all, um, and please feel free to use the chat or the Q and A. Um, that way we can also see how you um, how you're feeling. Um, so how are you being anti-racist in interactions with your colleagues or peers? So again, going back to that notion of action versus words. You know, Soraya, I really would like to hear from some of the folks about how how they are. Um, being anti-racist in their interactions. Does anyone yeah. want to? And so just unmute yourself and go for it. Don't be shy. 
I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Oh, uh, go ahead. Rebecca, go ahead, Rebecca. That'll be great. Okay. Um, well, I was just going to jump in um, because there's another member of our committee on here too. We're part of UMACRO, so Upper Midwest. And um, Phil Hunt uh, is part of our committee as well. And he is, uh, we have created a, a DEI committee within UMACRO. And we just hosted a talk in the last week uh, talking about confronting hard history and starting the conversation within our regional organization about hard history and, and how does that affect uh, higher education, specifically registrars and enrollment management. Uh, we talked about the history of the GI Bill and how at the beginning, it, it, you know, um, when it was put into place, how very racist the policies were of who could use the bill and when and where. Uh, so we we're starting to have that conversation just to get people used to thinking about it. Um, so that's one way that we're trying to do it um, within ACRO actually still, um, but at our regional level. Thank you for that. I, I was thinking about as an admissions professional about our processes and policies and procedures. And those who've known me a long time, we talk about these things in any session that we talk about that we that I have because we're looking at barriers, right? And as we look at the policies, practices, and procedures, one thing that I noticed is that there were some in the room who said they should know how to do this thing. Why is this so hard to do this thing? And the implication was that we knew who these people were, we knew what they looked like. We knew what demographic, there was some level of inferiority in their abilities was implied. And so we had to, uh, and I had to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're thinking about them, but what about us? You know, we always need to look at us and our policies that we have developed. Now I have to tell you something about COVID-19. It has turned my world upside down. But one thing it has done, it has forced my college and my office to look at our policies, practices, procedures, and make them easier and stop blaming the student and say, what did we put in place? What did we do wrong? We need to start with ourselves and look at those practices, procedures, policies, and guess what? Attitudes. And really take a hard look. And this book is hard to, it's hard because you got to work on yourself. So looking at that is looking at how we set up our application. Why is that hard? You know, uh, the registration process, why is that difficult? And why do we think, because we know how to do it, everybody knows how to do it. And that's where racism and classism and that intersection he talks about happens, which I was really fascinated with that part. I just attended the AAU registrar's meeting, and this was actually a topic of discussion um, that we targeted on today for about an hour, um, was the policies and procedures that we have currently in place and how those disproportionately affect some of our students of color. Uh, some of the schools have actually gone so far as to look at some of the data in relation to when students are able to enroll. Certain schools were using students' AP scores and IB scores as a way to um, almost pad a student's score so that when it came time to enrollment, they had a higher priority when it came time to enroll. Some schools have gone through and looked at that data to see that yes, it was affecting um, students of color and they are starting to take that out of how they um, allow students to be able to enroll for courses, similar to some of the ways that we uh, handle student um, admission. So in the registrar's area, we've taking the, the time that COVID has given us to look at those policies and procedures and not only how they um, affect students as far as, you know, we had a lot of paper processes. Students were taking paper and walking it all across campus. Well, we're in an age now where that's not a possibility. So a lot of us have switched to online. Um, how, how did those policies and procedures come into place? Is there a reason behind some of those? And so that's what we're doing now is digging into why are these policies in place? How did we get to this? And are we still headed in the right direction for this particular policy? Or is now the time for us to make some changes? You're talking about creating strategic plans, setting a goal, 
and, and creating strategic plans that eliminates those things that may be racist in nature. Things that we did not think were racist at all. But if you have a child who does, has never had anyone go to college, has not spoken to anyone about it, then they are completely confused and sometimes will just stop. This is not for me because they become so frustrated. So Tiffany and Cassandra, and I'm sure others on this call, your actions are the things that will start to make a difference. And don't stop that, don't stop that work. Because once you remember my onion, once you unpeel one layer, you're gonna find something else. So keep your, your eyes and your ears open so that you can be um, enrich the process for everyone, not just one person. And I'll say one thing before I go back to you, Soraya, mm -hmm. is that my field has been healthcare, uh, HR and nursing, the whole nine yards. The very same thing that was uncovered with this, um, um, you know, I call it the plague or, or with this virus, where we re recognize the disparity in healthcare, you too will what recognize and it will become clear the disparities that exist in institutions. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Joyce. I, you know, um, kind of going back to when you mentioned, you know, that we need to do this work. Um, I can't help also but feel challenged by, okay, who all attended this? You know, are we just preaching to the choir, right? Who needs to be here? Who's, who is here and who's not here? And why are those people not here? Uh, assuming, you know, time and everything, right? I'm talking on, more, on, more, on a more global, uh, larger level. Um, you know, who read this book? Who didn't, who needs to read this book? And why didn't they read this book? Um, I think that that kind of is what, what what gets at me a bit. Um, you know, the, there's, and, and I'm, I'm gonna use a personal anecdote right now. Um, I, I am the child of undocumented Mexican immigrants. Um, and I've actually, I've restructured all of my biographies to start with that. Um, number one, because I'm tired of being asked the, uh, where are you from question, <laughs> or where are you really from? because uh, my name and all the vowels and everything just, you know, and my complexion apparently very much confuse, confuses people. Um, but being a child of undocumented Mexican immigrants, um, that shaped my perspective on everything. Um, and in, in, including who speaks ill of people like me and people like my parents. Um, so there are people within our community that um, will be very cordial to me. Um, and then what their actions will be very different than how they're being towards me. So, you know, they will go on to their social media and discuss how people like my parents, you know, are horrible people that are leeches that, uh, we're drug dealers and rapists and all that other negative, you know, stuff that uh, was put out there. But then those same people are coming back to me saying, "What? How great I am!" And congratulations on A, B, and C. Well, okay, is it that you, you you hate people like me and my parents, or that you respect me because I'm I'm one of the quote unquote good ones? So which is it? It can't be, you know. This anti-racist work, you can't compartmentalize it. Because um, I, I think that's, and, and that's where it, that's, that's where you get the, oh, I'm not racist. Well, you know, the heartbeat of racism is denial. Um, so I, I, I think that's what kind of gets me coming back to what, who, who, who attends, who's here now in this room, who read this book? Um, and who needs to, and why aren't those, why aren't certain people reading this book? I don't, that's my struggle. Raya, thanks for so much for sharing that. Uh, if you notice when I introduced myself, I gave the name of my slave grandfather. 
I gave it for a purpose. People think that that is so far removed from who we are today. To, I hand those papers to my grandchildren so they start to understand what this country was built on. And I, I would tell you that Kindy's other book, hard to read, but buy it. Do not get it on, on uh, one of your devices because you have to constantly reread the book and reread sections. And I say that because no one understands what this country has been built on. I think we understood on January 6th that it was raising its ugly head. It has been there. But I understand what you're saying. What do you do, Soraya? What actions do you take? Do you keep those individuals in your group or do you go and teach? Yeah. Because it takes a lot of energy to always have to explain to everybody everything. Right. It's a heart to do that. And, and I have found myself, and I'm going to be honest with everybody here, I have found myself with the death of George Floyd and every and the upheaval angrier than I've ever been in my life. And I'm working through that. I haven't resolved it yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm working through it with making sure that I'm working towards being an anti-racist. Well, and as Candy, you know, Dr. Candy mentions, you know, he compares racism to cancer. Mm -hmm. um, when he did that comparison, it just, I mean, how it, it kind of speaks to what you were saying right now. It just, it makes you angry. Um, and what does that anger, it, it consumes us, our bodies physically, it can. Um, yeah, I think we can move on to, we're gonna we are gonna break do it go into breakout rooms just so everybody knows um and this is something that um to keep in mind is are we willing to endure the grueling fight against racist power and policy um and the other part that everyone needs to i really want to kind of bring everyone's attention to is are we willing to transform the anti-racist power we gather within us to anti-racist power in our society there's work to be done and this is an incredible quote uh, from the book that, that keeps with that whole concept of challenge and the journey. And our willingness to do so. Yeah. Let's go to the next quote. So what do we do now? Um, we've read this book. Uh, we've had, you know, these discussions. Um, so when we we're going to go into our breakout rooms uh something to really think about is what, looking forward you know what actions do we take and also um how do we take care of ourselves you know um recently it was audrey lord's birthday and i hope everybody saw the google doodle um celebrating her and you know she famously has mentioned how self-care um, is an act and i'm paraphrasing here self-care um is an act of revolution it it to, you need to take care of yourself if you're going to, you know, do this kind of work, because if not, it's just gonna, it's just going to consume you um, and probably not in a good way. So these are things that we're going to keep in mind as we break into our uh, individual groups. So I'll see you in the break room. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is Mike. Just uh, I'm about to randomly assign everybody. So this should be about five people or so per room. Um, we have a staff member that will bounce in and out just to make sure everything is going well in there. But um, best of luck, everybody.
I left the breakout room, but I'm not able to join other breakout rooms, but I was going to say, let's give like a one minute warning to everyone in breakout rooms. Uh, right now? Yeah. Okay. One minute or two minute warning? Two minute warning so they can wrap it up. Okay. Um, we just have after this, it's just the kind of group discussion based on what this was. Yeah. Okay, so, and then after that, that's like just marketing stuff, right? Yeah, I think they wanted to, because we wanted to have like a larger discussion after they come back from the breakout rooms. Okay, all right, I'll, um, let me hop into the one with, uh, with Joyce and okay. uh, actually maybe I'll do that with Saraira and I'll see how long she wants yeah, to. You can ask them to see how long they think they need. Yeah. Let me assign you to room three. That's the one with Joyce, and uh, and you can send a chat there, and I'll come back here in just a minute. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, 251 for the warning sounds fine. Yeah, it seems like the breakout rooms are going well in terms of discussion, so. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, and that, that was the thing is, I mean, it's, it's, as I was telling Joyce, uh, a pretty good crowd, like 30 is pretty manageable for this. And um, I think having the number of people that we have in each one, it helps, you know, get everybody engaged. So that's always good. Yeah, I'm happy. I think that this book club discussion has been our most engaged yet, and I'm excited mm -hmm. to see the places too. So, the thing yeah, is it definitely requires more work. Um, yeah, for sure. We had to do like slides and a run through and figuring out like what the topics were, whereas before it was very organic, and I just kind of left it up to the host. But it's doable. There's a good amount of lead time though too. I think we put this up in early January. 
I guess we always kind of knew that a five to six week horizon or timeline is, is kind of ideal for any virtual event because people have yeah. to schedule out. But for these book clubs, it's even more important just because you're supposed to read it. And this one in particular, we were supposed to have at the last annual meeting. So this gives yeah. a lot of So people have really had like a one year lead time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it's just so topical right now too. So even, even without the acro portion of it, there's a good chance a lot of people just read it on their own because the relevancy of it. The relevant, yeah, or re became relevant, yeah. I mean- All right, you wanna send the message? Uh, oh yeah, sure. And Soraya and Joyce are great hosts. I think they're playing ball mm -hmm. with each other. That's sent. I mean, it should be enough for them to wrap up. I should have done a uh, a more extensive breakout room setup, but I didn't know how much we would use them. How extensive are you thinking? So, well, not extensive per se, but usually I have, I don't know that there is an option for non co host to actually leave the room. Um, when I was going to, usually I, after I start a breakout, it's like locked in the way it's set. And I'm not yeah. at one, I had the leave room option set up. And two, I'm not sure that uh, when I close the rooms, usually I have the option of putting a countdown timer on, uh, but I don't know that I can do that this time. So I think when I close these rooms, they're just gonna instantly be closed. If there is the option for a countdown, I might give like 30 seconds just so people can wrap up a thought they might've had. When you have like the menu for breakout rooms, I guess, I don't know what else to call it, but like the options for it, like, does it show anything or like, is it just like end breakout rooms? Um, right now I have the broadcast option and I have yeah. all rooms. Those are my, my two buttons. Normally I feel like I have some other buttons available to me. Um, but like I said, once you, once you start a breakout room, it's like that, that setting is locked in. You can't change it on the fly. Yeah. I would just drop in another message now and be like, I'm closing out the breakout rooms and then just close them out. That way they're not just cut off mid sentence. Oh, oh there we go. There we go. Yeah, a little abrupt, but. I know. Oh. I, I said so much meaningful things and then, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just got cut off. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I was really deep in conversation there, right? <laughs> yes, we I'm sorry. I was just lamenting <laughs> with uh, with Faduma. It's like I usually have the option of doing a countdown, so I pressed close, yeah. but instead it just kicked everybody out. So I apologize <laughs> for interrupting. Thanks to my team, um, we had some great discussions. So we did too, and um, I am very encouraged by the people who are in our group and our team and their work. And part of this abruptness, I'm just gonna share what uh, we're talking about self-care. And I told them that one of the things that I was doing in terms of self-care with my friends who are Caucasian uh, or you know, are different than I am, I have told them very honestly what I'm going through, what I'm examining, my self-examination and telling them that I'm no longer willing to stay quiet so that they can be comfortable. And so I was super honest with them what I was doing. And so the part that I'm wondering if we were able to get to as a group was the self-care part. And it is going to take self-care on your part to do the journey and do the work. Yes, thank you. And we actually didn't get to the self-care part in our group either. Um, and I know I, I paraphrased uh, Audre Lorde's quote, but I did want to actually give you the um, the actual quote um, because I th it's, it's such a powerful quote and it's caring for myself is not self-indulgent. It is self-preservation and it is an act of political warfare. Um, so I think 
keeping that in mind, it's, you know, we can't do this work without taking care of ourselves, mm -hmm. right? I think we can go to the next slide. I think we're gonna have it open now if um, anybody wants to say anything. So, you know, share your experiences, what's on your mind, you know, how are you feeling um, reading this book or just in general. Or something you weren't able to say in the group that you wanted to, you were cut off and yeah. <laughs> wanted to say it. Because Mike cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're forgiven. Yes. <laughs> I want to say that this is an evolution, evolutionary process. And I have to go back and reread some things. This was a slow read. I had to really read and process. And I want to go back to some of the things and kind of just, just one thing at a time and just kind of rethink how I will act on this. What would be my next steps? And a lot of this is working on myself. Um, I, I saw some things there that I did not like if I'm truth be told. Uh, and I'm gonna be working on myself and uh, self-care is something I need to get a little bit more serious about as we all do in higher education because we're working like fiends in this uh, in COVID, in this pandemic. I call it pandemic interrupt us or whatever you wanna call it. But um, truly I have a lot of work to do. This has been a, a wonderful discussion uh, and I'm like uh, Sorara, Sorara, who is not here who needs to be here? That's an important question. And I think the other question that you can ask is how do I help people to move and walk alongside of me or even behind me in this journey? Because Part of the journey is partnering with other people so that you can move forward. Right. And I think something when when taking on that journey, we need to remember, it's at least something that I constantly have to remind myself of, is that, you know, for a lot of folks, racism is new. This is a new thing. This this just happened, you know, with the murder of George Floyd um, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, the pandemic forced everybody to stop and really pay attention to what was going on. There was no sports to distract us. There was no award show. There was nothing but our lived reality. Um, and that's something that I constantly remind myself of. It's like, oh, right. To you, racism is new. This, you know, police brutality is a new thing that's just being aired. You know, this book came out in 2019. <laughs> before the pandemic. Uh, we all know that th this is not a new thing, but to some people it is. And that's something that we need to, you know, as we're doing this work, remind ourselves, you know, the, the different levels that people are at with their experiences um, and with this work in itself and within our institutions and in our communities. And you will create, you will find allies but you will also create allies with the right communication. And I think that that's the exciting part. We don't close this book and say that it's all done. We know that the work, it's going to take years, but each of us can do one or two things that will make a difference. Well, that brings us to 12 p.m. Um, I don't want to, I want to be mindful of everybody's time. So, um, Just as a reminder, Dr. Kendi is our ACRO speaker. Uh, I'm really excited, but I, I've been excited about this since 2019. So, so this is going on two years of excitement. Um, so thank you ACRO for, for bringing uh, Dr. Kendi to our membership. And thank you, NSC. And thank you for the opportunity to share today. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Hopefully we see you at the uh, virtually, unfortunately, at the annual meeting.
Thank you, everyone. Nothing, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.